it's changed, that their jobs have disappeared. When you work together, when you work collectively, like, we hear many like stories in our centre of workplace bullying, so we think we know the tactics pretty well. Because we're women and because we need flexibility, that we have to give up all our rights. Inspiring, fantastic um, and a little bit overwhelming at the best of times. We don't expect to just put the claws in and send you on your merry way. You need support mechanisms. Fun, innovative and supporting. Any workplace that allows bullying is not a safe workplace for anyone. Well, women are 50% of um, the workforce now and they're also 50% of union membership. I get the feeling that there's a real sense of power amongst women now in the union movement, um, that they can get together and really make a change. On the ACTU Women's Committee, we have a Wimdory subcommittee, and so they're getting in place structures within their unions and within the union movement as a whole to support and push through issues that need to be addressed by the union movement that a lot of people might not know about or might not think are important, but now that we've got a structure that allows that voice to be heard right up to the top peak body, it helps those issues get addressed. It is an opportunity for women from all male dominated industries. You know, we've got the fireys, we've got electricians, we've got, you know, wharfies, seafarers. In the one room, where all these women think, okay, I was alone in my workplace, wow, they were alone in their workplace too and they get to talk about that. And it's, it's just an incredible experience and it's well worth it and it probably should be more often. Having Jed there is, is fantastic and uh, that whole issue about needing to have someone who understands your issues and who is willing to stick their neck out and push for them at a top senior level where they have some influence is critical. I know you've got a long road to travel in your sectors and the industries in which you work are still pretty blokey. Is that right? I guess that's true. And I do welcome this group's willingness to come together and to engage on these issues. Now, women in the workforce in 2012, we make up half the workforce, half the workforce. If you look at participation graphs, and a woman called Barbara Pocock does some fantastic research around this, female participation since the 50s has risen almost to the point, as I said, half of men. So we are equal now as far as who's working and who's not, but, only, but we get paid, sadly, nearly 18% less, 17.5% less than men on average. Shame. Shame. 3% <laughs> of Australia's 200 largest companies have female CEOs. On average, women have just 37% of men's pension savings at retirement. You know, we're 51% of the population. Why shouldn't we have the same opportunities as what men do? It's purely equity about having the same opportunities no matter where you work. And let's face it, the areas that we represent are the high paid areas. So why shouldn't women have the opportunity to be actually, to be able to work in areas that are high, higher paid? Better conditions, um, you know, shorter working hours for more money. Well, it was fantastic to see a room full of women doing such amazing things in all kinds of industries and all working out, thinking about how to improve women's share of jobs that are often well paid, yeah, decent careers, how to um, make those better jobs for women and get more women into them. So I was really inspired by that room full of women and many of them with decades of experience doing this stuff. My job up in Newcastle in 1981 through to 1984 was getting women into non-traditional occupations, into trades. And we went from 11 women at the beginning of our program. This was the um, give a girl a spanner. Um, you know, the, there's, just, there's a whole lot of stickers and television ads and all that kind of stuff. And we went from 11 women to 223 women in two years in plumbing, in all of the really tough trades in a very male town. And it was hard work. And it was hard work not for me going around trying to spiel it to BHP and coal companies and so on. It was really hard work for the women who got their heart's desire to be a carpenter or a plumber. So um, 
I think we know why we try and do this. Men's jobs are often better paid, have a real career, you get skills that matter. Um, there's a really good reason for going for increasing women's sh share of these jobs. It really matters in the labour market, but it's not easily done. It's what I take from our discussion is that these issues have been there for 30 years, the last 30 years. How do we get women into these jobs? How do we keep them in these jobs? How do we make sure they're getting the, the fair pay and decent conditions that you know, often characterise male-dominated employment? The issues haven't changed in 30 years and we really need to keep women talking to each other, organising, keep unions on the job, making sure that this kind of connection and conversation is ongoing. We've still got a very gender segmented labour market, lots of men in the higher paid occupations and lots of women who've got the skills, certainly got the brains and want to be part of it. Now another thing I want to raise with you today that I hope, um, I'm wondering if you will discuss it over the next three days, is the issue of family and domestic violence. No one wants to imagine that someone they work with is dealing with domestic violence at home. But for many women, it's a reality. Family and domestic violence is a workplace issue in which unions can play a role and help those workers experience it to keep their job. Just imagine if you are a victim of domestic violence, if you're having to go to hospital, if you're having to pack up your house and find somewhere safe to live, if you're being harassed by an aggressive or a violent partner, just imagine if you lost your job as well. It'd just be the last straw. And a lot of women do. They lose their jobs because they don't feel they can speak up about it at work. They use up all their sick leave, all their holiday pay to go to court, to do whatever it is that they have to do, and they don't feel that they can talk about it at work. I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about this. We don't, we've got 400 workers. No one's ever come forward and told us that they're experiencing domestic violence. Why would they, if they don't feel safe? I hear that all the time. It doesn't happen in our workplace. We're a respectful workplace. You just don't know about it. I get emotional talking about this because it's very close to home for me. It is the tip of the iceberg, as um, Jed said, but every worker and every woman in this room and every woman that you meet should have access to these provisions. That's how passionate I am, and I hope my passion can go into your DNA and you can feel it as passionately as I do. It was an so abusive relationship in that I it was emotional and psychological it. abuse. There was a whole lot of jealousy, a lot of controlling. Um, it was slow over time. I look back through the relationship and I saw little bits over the years that had happened and that sort of thing, but it built massively after I had my second child. And we had bought a business. Um, and I wasn't allowed to return back to work after that. So I became extremely isolated in the house. Um, I was restricted in certain friends that I was allowed to have. Uh, by the end, my sister was even encouraged that she wasn't necessarily accepted into the house either. And so it was through that that I started to realise I didn't know who I was anymore. I, I was at home permanently with two young children and I'm a social person, I needed to be out, I needed something more in my life than that. And I just, I couldn't handle that restriction anymore. And so with the encouragement from an outside source that kind of made me aware of what was happening, I then went through the Northern Domestic Violence Centre and they sort of spoke me through some issues and how I could get some further help. And yeah, so then with the support of my family and them, I, uh, I got out and it was a very tough decision and it was an extremely tough process afterwards. Um, I was very mentally unstable and unwell during that period of time as well. Um, for the first week that I left, I actually left without my children, which was impossible, but I had to do it because I had to get myself well before I could actually care for them and continue to change our life for the future at the same time. So, yeah, but then we found ourselves some housing and started the change. Being a child of the 80s and growing up through the 90s, um, with messages of women being able to do anything that a man could was a really big influence and stuck with me a lot. I always had a sense that I could do anything that I wanted to. I had then tears in my eyes when she was talking about her journey through the powerful pathways in TAFE here in South Australia to getting her apprenticeship 
and the empowerment that she's felt in taking on a role that many women you know, would think that they perhaps couldn't do and maybe she had doubts along the way. But her joy and excitement uh, in going into that role and how that has changed her life affected, I think, us all really deeply. The day I found out I had been successful in getting my apprenticeship, you could not wipe the smile off my face. It was an amazing feeling. I was very proud of myself in all that I had done and what my future was going to hold for me and for my children. My first day of work, I was an absolute bundle of nerves, but I was happy. I'm in a job that I love, and every day I look forward to going to work. And now, here I am today, I'm a first year electrical apprentice, and I'm sharing my story with you. So, thank you very much for listening. Recently we have two domestic violence clauses up in two different companies for the MUA. It's the first of our in our industry and it's it's really important step forward. Maternity leave and paternity leave um, has always been on the agenda but now we're increasing the amount of leave and the amount of flexibility when you come back to work. Like any industry, if, um, if a woman starts a family she you know she often doesn't come back to the workforce but the majority of our uh, the women in our union do come back because they love the job. You know, it's, it's an unusual job, it's a different job, it's um, a flexible job, and they do come back. So we need to look after them and give them the, the ability to be able to do that. Get out there and give it a go. Even if it's something you've never thought of doing before, try it. If you fail, so what? Who's it gonna impact on? How's it gonna change anything? You've experienced something, you've done something. It's different. And then if you're successful at it, who knows how it might change your life. I mean, it, it could just be the most amazing experience you've ever had. So why not just try it? Just give it a go and yeah, experiment. See what you're good at. You don't always know you're gonna be good at something until you've actually done it and tried it. So if the opportunity comes up, get out there and do it, yeah. Strong unions need women. <laughs> um, supportive, exciting and education. It's in inspiration and it's ideas. It's the beginning. Um, fun, innovative and supporting. Professional, inspiring and sustaining. Inspirational, empowering, educational. Amazing. Relationship building. Motivational. Inspiring. Action. Essential, eye-opening, powerful. Informative. Uh, getting women together and working together on um, women's issues. <laughs>